Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name everyone. is Luis Costa Rivas, and I'm your moderator for this virtual roundtable hosted by Friends of Angola. We are live from the United States and Angola to the rest of the world, and we are joined today by a distinguished panel of Angolans and Angolans friends, which I will introduce to you in a moment. First, for those joining us for the first time, a few words about Friends of Angola. Friends of Angola is an international non-government and advocacy organization established in 2014 in Washington, D.C. It has special advisory status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council and focuses its action on the defense of human rights, promotion of transparency, and good governance in Angola. It's within this framework that Friends of Angola hosts today's virtual roundtable to address the democratic process and the procedures for legalizing political parties in Angola. To do just that, we are joined by a distinguished panel, in which I will now introduce to you. I will need to check my notes. But our first guest is Abel Shivukuvuku. He needs no introduction for most Angolans. He's a veteran of Angolan politics and one of the historic political leaders of the country. He's currently the leader of Praja Servir Angola, a political project he's trying to register as a political party. In its Portuguese acronym, which can be loosely translated to as right away, Praja is the party for Angolan renewal together for Angola. He's been having some trouble trying to register the party and we'll get to that in a minute as part of our conversation. We're also joined by Elias Isaac, who was the Angola country director for the Open Society Initiative for Southern Africa until 2018. Before that, he worked for USAID and also for the International Republican Institute. He is also an ordained minister. We are also joined by Malik Shaka, a retired US government official. He has served as a director of the Millennium Challenge Corporation and also as a professional staff member of the Africa Subcommittee of the United States House of Representatives. He first visited Angola as a journalist in 1973, and he has maintained this bond to Angola ever since. He also wrote about Angola for many African newspapers and European publications dedicated to Africa. He was also a member of a commission that issued a special paper, special report on US-Angola relations for the Council on Foreign Relations in 2007. So gentlemen, welcome to all of you. It's a honor to have you participate in this initiative. And as we discuss Angola's democracy under a new presidency, I would like to start first, because we are going to address the problems with the registration of political parties. I'd like to ask first uh, from Elias Isaac, if you would provide us with a simpler and layperson explanation of what it is like to register a political party in Angola and what is the process? Well, uh, the, the real problem, uh, the real problem for political party registration in Angola is not the legal framework, it's the political interest of the ruling party. That's the, that's the bottom line. As long as the interest of the ruling party is contemplated, is safeguarded, political party registration is not a problem. Because we have a constitution, which is very clear, that citizens are allowed to organize themselves and to participate. But then we have ordinary laws in Angola that violate this constitutional provision, whereby it says that now it's up to the constitutional court uh to allow the formation of political parts to operate in angola so you have you know a scenario where the constitution gives you this right then you have an ordinary law that controls this right and you know and that's where the problem is uh, uh as as long as we have in angola ordinary laws that violates the basic constitutional rights, we are going to have problems like this. Mr. Abel Shivukuvuku, you have been trying to register your party, Praja Servir Angola. Uh, is this what you have found in your interactions with the legal system as you try to register your political party? We decided as Angolans in 1991 to change the regime in Angola. 
from a one-party Marxist-Leninist state to a liberal democracy. The problem is, do we believe all believe in the values, in the principles of a liberal democracy, or those who were the Marxist-Leninists just metamorphosed themselves to pretend, and this has been the problem. In 2010, we enacted a new constitution. As far as the uh, rights and, uh, of the citizens is well advanced, but the practice is completely different. What we have here is whatever is done by every institution of the state is determined by the MPLA political party. The courts, ordinary courts and the constitutional court, all the administration, everything, the machinery of the state is determined by the interest of the ruling party. And in our case, it's clear that it's not the law, it's not the regulations. It's a decision of the ruling party and judges not to allow. Because we went, we went even further than what the law obligates us to do. Specifically, what did the court- signatures of citizens. Uh, I'm sorry, you're cutting off. Can you please uh, repeat that? We lost the last part of your sentence. In the first phase of the process, we asked for the uh, enactment of the name of the organization, Praja. And the court said, you cannot be Praja. You have to change it. Then we decided to say, okay, is Praja Servir Angola? Praja serve Angola. And they were forced to accept it. We went into the second phase, which is to bring in 7,500 signatures. As we knew about the problems that we would face, we collected 25,000 signatures of citizens with the copies of their IDs and also the certificate of residence in the municipalities because the law determines that. And the administrators of the municipalities are all of the employees, but they are forced to, they are, by law, they have to give this certificate, which is paid. And we did everything. We collected 23,000 just to make sure that there is no problem. We, we send this to the Constitutional Court with all other requirements. The Constitutional Court decided that it was not valid. Uh, we lost the connection to Luanda. Mm -hmm. And what I think Mr. Shivukovuku is saying that even though- the Documents. Okay. Said, okay, fine. If you cannot give us... Well, uh, I'm still talking. We, I don't know if we, you are hearing. We, we lost you there for a while. We, we lost I'm you there. So, I'm talking. Yeah, we lost you there for a while. We can hear you now. Uh, so you said that you submitted 23,000 signatures. And what did the court say? What was their reply to you? Can you hear the us? The court Mr. said that they only, I'm hearing. Okay, go um, ahead. On the 23,000 signatures that we submitted with all the documents confirming this submission, the court accepted only about 3,000. Refuses, you refused 19,000. What was their justification for doing that? Well, I think we lost the signal from Luanda again, and we'll try and get Mr. Shibukovuku back on. But in the meantime, Malik Shaka, I, I would turn to you. These are not a lot of facts, but I think we have a basic Joint framework team. here. The court? And, and Malik, uh, I'm sorry, we lost you, and we're trying to reestablish a good uh, connection to Angola. And I was now asking Malik Shaka to based on what we hear from Mr. Ravel Shivukuvuku, you submit 23,000 signatures. They, they basically accept 3,000 and trash 20,000. Um, the new president, uh, João Lourenço, is getting a lot of credit for certain things that he's doing in Angola, namely a very visible um, fight against corruption. But Malik, do you think that problems like these will interfere with people's perception of what this new government is doing uh, about their commitment to democracy when when things like these happen 
people in the United States have been following the angle of the process closely. There was a great deal of admiration for President Joao Lorenzo for changes he had made, for moves in the direction of addressing the issue of the deep-seated corruption. But when a political party can't register and a political party led by an individual who is known in the United States and has a good reputation in the United States, then people begin to call into question the government of Angola's commitment to democracy. And when I heard that it, it could only come back and try to re-register in four years, this is totally unsatisfactory. And I think that people of goodwill, Democrats with a small d, um, would be worried and concerned about it. Uh, Elias Isaac, I would like to hear your take on the consequences of these for the Angolan democracy and the Angolan civil society. Basically, uh, why would someone feel threatened by an emerging party, possibly a small party from the beginning? I mean, if the MPLA has been, been in power for so many years, they have every instrument and resource at their disposal. Uh, why do you think they should act in a way that suggests fear of a new party? Well, uh, let, let me just go back on the issue of corruption, which uh, apparently, you know, is giving uh, the new president a lot of credit. But corruption cannot only be defined, you know, financially. In Angola, there is a systemic corruption that, you know, uh, affects the political system, affects the elections system because our electoral process is corrupt. It's the whole structure, it's the whole structure of governance. So corruption is not just financial. It's the whole issue of governance of this country, you know, starting from the, from the, from the courts. It's, it affects all areas of our of our lives. So corruption, we cannot just limit uh, corruption in this case just because it's trying, you know, to do for, uh, fight against financial corruption. Let me say this, you know, in nineteen in nineteen ninety one, the the ruling party, you know, did not have problems in registering hundreds of political parties, you know, and by that time, you know, it only required uh, 1,500, you know, signatures. Uh, so it was so easy. And, you know, along the time, you know, we saw a number of political parties, you know, being registered. What I've said in the beginning is that, you know, Angola for 45 years, even from 1992, has never experienced a plural democracy. We can call it, you know, a multi-party democracy, but it's not a plural democracy. Because 45 years in Angola, there has never been any change. Even from 1992, there has been no change, no single change in the, in the political system. So we cannot call it a democracy. And from what, from what we know histor historically, you know, uh, democracy was an imposition to the ruling party. The ruling party does not believe in democracy. It, it was not part, from the, of, it's not part of, a, of their ideological structure. It's not part of their ideology. Democracy is not part. We know the history. So for them to move to a pluralistic, a democracy, it requires, you know, a complete change in the current political system in Angola. Let so me, what we, Let me follow up on that. Okay. Uh, before we get uh, further with that, we're going to come back to that, uh, to that type of reasoning in just a minute. Let me just follow up on that and go back to uh, Mr. Abel Shivuku Vuku, um, who's joining us from Luanda at the Praja Servir Angola headquarters, uh, to ask him, if you think the government is doing this on purpose so that you cannot 
have your political party, then why do you think they're afraid of you? First of all, in 2017, there was no alternative, no alternance in Angola. This is the same party that has been ruling Angola for 45 years, the same individuals in government, the same political culture, and the same misbehavior. That's the basic. It's true that people expected or had some expectations about Ron Lorenzo's rise. But those expectations faded completely. The single problem that is making the MPLA not accept Praja is the fear that because of the divisions within the MPLA that run deep in the structure, from the top level down to the base, they believe that those who are, who are against João Lourenço, those who don't agree with what João Lourenço has been doing, will support Praja. That's the basic reason. And with Praja in the political space, the balance of power will shift completely. That's the reason. Because all we did could, could be sufficient to credentiate three or four parties. We need only 7,500. The first phase, we submitted 23,000. They admitted only 3,000. The 20,000, they didn't accept. We asked for the documents back. They didn't accept. They said that it's not allowed. We, pro we had accepted and we said, OK, let us have a joint team to verify the papers. They didn't accept. Then we decided to make another collection of papers from the citizens. And we collected another 8,000. In this phase, we did it differently. We asked the citizens, we joined the, BI, the, the, the IDs, and then we went to the administrations. But we, we went also to the notarial services to confirm the signatures of the individuals. Because the justifications that the court has been using is no recognition of the administration. The administration is not, not our problem, it's the state. And then they decide also to not accept the documents that were recognized by the notarial services. All this is just fake. The reality is that they do not want us to become a political party. That's the problem for fear that those who are disenfranchised from the MPLA will change. Uh, Malik Shaka, when you hear about these and when you realize that Angola should have been organizing local elections for a long time, um, why do you think Angola has not have had any local elections as prescribed by uh, the Constitution? On the African continent as a whole, there is an aversion to local elections. Power is always concentrated in the capital, and the people who are living outside of the capital have almost no power. Top down rule. In Angola today, not allowing local elections presents a huge problem, but the problem to me is bigger than one of local elections or the failure to register a political party. It's the state of governance in the country and it runs across numerous categories, transparency, fiscal corruption, the state acting against civil society and political actors. The problem, in fact, is a lack of democracy in the country. And the regime has the ability to hold the mass movement, to hold opposition political parties, civil society, from moving ahead. If I could ask a question here, um, to the people on the panel. My question has to do with what has been the reaction of Democrats with a small d in Angola to the government's refusal to register this political party? And what have civil society had to say on the issue? Have churches, for example, come out and opined? It's not a question of whether one supports 
Mr. Chivuku Vuku or not. It's a question of whether one supports democracy. Okay, or, Elias, you want to get started with that, with the question that Malik just left out there? Absolutely. Uh, one, thing, one thing is for sure that uh, in, in 2017, uh, a lot of us were, you know, eluded, you know, we, we fall into an illusion that things are going to change. And we forgot one fundamental thing. The problem of Angola has nothing to do with an individual. The problem of Angola has to do with the systemic, with the system that has been in government in power for 45 years. That's reality. And most civil society organizations, you know, uh, we, we celebrated change, but we, because of one person, which in reality, this person is part of the system. Uh, the, other, the, the other issue is that, you know, when you talk about churches, uh, it's very difficult. Most of our churches, with the exception of the Catholic Church, with the exception of a Catholic Church, most of the churches have no political voice, you know? Most of the churches are so scared to embrace a political social agenda that they believe, you know, they believe that, you know, this is not part of their agenda. So most of the church, with the exception of the, of the Catholic church. So it's very difficult, you know, to count on churches on issues like this one, you know. They are not, they are not allies of the democracy. Let me say this, you know. Churches are not allies of democracy, and the, uh, I, 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 don't, I do not hesitate to say that churches are not allied, allies to human rights, which democracy, you know, is also embedded, with exception of the, of the Catholic Church. With civil society organizations, we have been trapped. We have been trapped with the illusion that, you know, one person from the same system is going to change. It's not going to change anything because the problem is the system, is the structure of governance for 45 years. Okay, Mr. Abelshi Vukuvuku, would you like to tackle that question too? Hello, Mr. Shivukuvuku, can you hear us? Well, we cannot hear you right now. Um, hopefully, the connection will be reestablished with Luanda and we will be able to have Mr. Abel Shivukuvuku back with us. In the meantime, uh, let us continue with our other panelists. Oh, Abel Shivukuvuku, we can see you on camera now. Can you hear us and can you address the question? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you. Okay, go ahead, please. I'm hearing you. What we need to understand is that for the 45 years that Angola is independent, the ruling part has had hegemonic control of all institutions, even in the private sector. If we look into the central government, all are members of the MPLA. There are not even independents. If we look at the 18 provinces, all provinces are governed by MPLA members who are simultaneously the secretaries of the party in the provinces. If we look into the 164 municipalities, all of them are governed by MPLA leaders, and all of them cumulate with the function of party secretaries. We the look into the 1,000 plus circumcisions at the local level, everything is controlled by the MPLA, hegemonic power. Is this reason that makes the MPLA reluctant to conduct uh, local elections because they know that if we have ever lecture, local elections, they will lose the hegemonic control that they have. This is number one. Number two is that there is also a level of total dependency by the private organizations on the MPLA. If it's business, unless you are with the government individuals, you cannot do serious business. If it's academics, you have to be well with the government because you cannot be a good intellectual. If even the civil service sector is not independent, the courts are not independent, <coughs> what we have in Angola is a total authoritarian, is 
constitution. And that's what we need to change because even the courts are coordinated by the political bureau of the MPLA. This is the problem. How do you ch change that if, like you just suggested, the political party system is weak, the civil society is weak, uh, the implementation of the constitution is weak? How do you change that? We have now a noble opportunity because the MPLA is divided and is seriously weak. One of the reasons why they don't have, they don't want to conduct local elections, which we had agreed upon to be this year 2020, is because they knew that at the local level, Oh, I think we're having some problems with our connection uh, with, uh, with Luanda That's today. That's a better condition. Come on, come on. We lost you for a while, but now you're back. Come on, go ahead. No, apparently not again. What I was saying is that there is no elections because the MPA no. Okay, well, let, let us continue. We'll, we'll go back to Luanda as soon as we can. Let us continue then. Um, I will be Yes, Elias, go ahead. Uh, one, one of the biggest challenges, you know, uh, both Maliki and Abel have stated, is the conception of power, centralized power. And uh, it is so easy, you know, during the electoral, the electoral process to conduct fraud and rigging elections. Now, as you know very well from your experience where you, where you live, local elections define uh, what, what I call, you know, the geographic electoral, you know, the geography of elections in any democracy. So rigging, you know, not just for local elections, even for nation elections, where if you have local elections, rigging, nation elections would be so difficult for you because local local elections were established you know a a local geographic election system which is very easy for us to do predictions and to to conduct pollings and so on this is what the government does that the ruling part doesn't does does not want they want us to make us believe that they control they have support, not that they control. They have support everywhere. Everybody in every locality supports them, which is not true. Uh, Malik, when we talk about elections in Angola, I don't think we can bypass the many controversies surrounding uh, the um, election commission. Um, is there any hope to turn the uh, Comissão Nacional de Eleições, the National Electoral Commission, into an independent organization that is accepted by all, and that it's not constantly contested? What would be the solution for that? I think there has to be an expectation by international actors that change is necessary and steps, concrete steps toward a democratic polity are also necessary. So the question then becomes, what are the major donors in Angola saying? What does the United States say? What does the UK say? What does Portugal, even though it's not a power, but has a 500 year relationship to the country, what do they say about this situation? Well, um, good question. What do you think, Mr. Shibuku, that they are saying, and is that what they should be saying? Uh, what we need to understand is number one, all of us, we had expectation that this paradigm could change with the emergence of Juan Lorenzo. But what we are hearing and what we are seeing in the last two years is that we are going backwards. 
at this moment, no institution is independent and serious. The government in the MPLA tries to control all political parties in this country, and they do not allow us to become a political party. The government and the MPLA ruling party controls or tries to control most of the organizations of the civil society. To some extent, because of conditions of the economy and so on, even businesses, private business, either they align with the ruling party or they don't succeed. Universities, the, 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 the deans of the universities were all indicated by the ruling party. Intellectuals cannot become intellectuals because they will lose the possibility of growing, meaning that the tendency with John Lawrence, even the press, the so-called private press is being also controlled. Now we don't have any more independent TV Zimbo. We do not have any more independent TV Palanque. Everything is being controlled. This is in accordance with the perception that the leaders of the empire know that the population has changed as far as behavior and understanding. And also within the MPLA, there is a large proportion of individuals who don't agree with the, the way the government, the government is ruling the country. Now, the question that we have is, what is most important? Hopefully we'll get the signal back from Luanda soon. As for them is the control of power, regardless of the situation of the country is concerned. That's the big problem. Lack of values, suppose lack of convictions, democratic conviction. Very good. We have uh, touched upon the subject of corruption. And um, at one point I just, uh, interrupted Elias Isaac as he was beginning to expand on that. Uh, and you were talking about corruption, Elias, and we know uh, that there's been many accusations that many um, Angolan leaders have become rich without an explanation. They don't have a public narrative they can supply for how they became so rich. Uh, João Lourenço has now embarked in what many see as a campaign against corruption. Some people say he's just going after Jose Eduardo dos Santos' family is not going really after the corruption in a systemic way. Uh, you have been following this issue and subject for a long time, uh, not the least when you were working for the Open Society Initiative. What is your take about the state of the fight against corruption in Angola, Elias? Well, let, let, let me just summarize, you know, uh, my answer uh, with, the, with, the, with the statement made by the defense lawyer of uh, uh, Dos Santos' son, Zenu. You know, the lawyer Sergio Raimondi said, you know, uh, if uh, it happens that, you know, uh, the ruling, uh, the, the, fight against the fight against corruption, it will mean the extinction the, then the, the, the courts have to declare the banning of the ruling party. What I'm saying is that, you know, <laughs> corruption has been, has been sustained, promoted, encouraged, uh, embraced by the ruling party. Uh, so the ruling party, you know, MPLA has been in power for 45 years. They are the ones who promoted it. They are the ones who created it. They, one, they are the ones who sustained it. So there is no fight against corruption in this country as long as those people who practice it, who encouraged it, who benefited from it, are the ones fighting it. It's not possible. So, and that's what we, that's what we are seeing today that, you know, uh, what we see in the in the news is, you know, uh, uh, you know, ordinary policemen being arrested, you know, one inspector, one simple inspector in the street being arrested, but people who have stolen millions and millions that everybody knows, they are scot-free, they are still there. Now, 
is this fight against corruption against you know the family of the former president probably yes they are the, one, they are the only ones who are being accused they are the only ones who are being arrested but these are not the only ones who have stolen from this country why do you think they're the targets now? Is it because they have the most money, the most visibility? Uh, why do you think they are the target now? Only, only the people do. Only the people arresting them are the ones who know. But we know, you but know. The former president of Santos' son, uh, José Filomeno, also known as Zenu, has just been sentenced to a, a, a prison term. Do you think that's a measure of progress? No, it's not. You know there is there you know there is a lady who, who was a municipal municipal administrator in Shingwari, uh, uh, BA province, who stole what uh, some 30, 40 million Kwanzaa, something like that. She got 12 years. Now someone who steals 500 million is about to get five years. What kind of justice is this one? Now, you get five years. Uh, now, the, the sentence is going to be reduced, and so on, then you get nothing. So, you know, so we, it's not, we, we cannot say that the fight against corruption in this country is producing results. There is nothing, because we know that there, if we talk about you know, Mr. Bell Shivokovuk just talked about the private sector. Listen, look at us what happened to Saint Vicente, the guy, the, the person who was, you know, the CEO and founder of the of the of, of the company, you know, which was what you call it, you know, a social security, you know, uh, mm -hmm. business, you know. Uh, she got you know, she she took over 900 million out of the country. What has happened? We know that people have stolen, people who have built, who have built, you know, condos and buildings with public money, they are just taking back, but they are not being arrested. They are not being taken to court. This does not make them, you know, uh, not being thieves, you know, mm -hmm. for you to return does not make you a good person. And this is what is happening in this country. You know, okay. the government is recovering, supposedly, you know, these assets that have been built by public funds, but justice is not being done because these people have profited, have profited from these investments. Very Where good. is the well, money? Justice. Mm -hmm. Well, if we, uh, Abel Shivukovuk, if we accept Elias Isaac's uh, contention, what he just said, then how should Angola proceed in the fight against corruption? If this is not the way, what do you think is the way? Well, we cannot hear um, Abel Shivukovuk again. While we wait for him to return, uh, we are getting several questions here. Uh, I'm reading from my screen. And the first question that I have I'm here talking. is for Malik Shaka. Uh, wait, oh, are, you, are you with us again? Are you hearing? We are hearing you now. Uh, your, your video signal had frozen and we could not hear. We can hear you now. Can you hear us? Yes, I'm hearing. So Maybe the question... The question was to what, what you propose the a fight against corruption should be like in Angola then. If not, if it's not working, what the government what is doing, what should they be doing? What we have to understand is that uh, after peace in 2002, corruption... Well, we have lost connection, our connection to uh, Luanda again. Um, you know, this is you know, quite out of our hands. Uh, and, and so for now, let us then go to the questions we have from our viewers who are following us from, from Angola. And the, the first question that I have here is for Malik Shaka from Malcolm Sholani. 
He says, my question to Mr. Malik Shaka is what influence nations like the U.S. and other Western countries may have since a citizen like Mr. Shivukuvuku is being deprived of exercising his political rights. So this is a question for you, Malik. Angola has a special relationship with the United States. It's one of three countries that has a strategic dialogue with the United States and at a ministerial level, they meet periodically to discuss things. On this basis, I say that the US has a special responsibility to confer with the Angolan government and, if, and say to the Angolan government, if you are really concerned about fighting corruption, then we will provide technical assistance to help make that possible. And that offer has been made. The United States would be able to bring people in from the US Treasury, from FinCEN, to begin to address issues like money laundering. The thing that baffles me, given the extent of corruption in Angola, is why the only people that have been accused have been members of President Dos Santos' family. Are they saying to us that corruption is confined to just the president's family? I would think not. There were very, very prominent people in Angola whose names were mentioned the gentleman who headed the uh, Casa Militar, for example, and other ambassadors and high-ranking MPLF issues. How much money has been returned to the Angolan government? This process also has to be very, very transparent. The government has a responsibility to the people to say, this is what our strategy is. This is how much money we've had returned. And some countries in turn have a special responsibility. I would point to Portugal, for example, where much of the investment in real estate and in companies has been from Angolan resources. Now they've cracked down on Isabel dos Santos, but I don't see indications that they have cracked down on anybody else. And this is cause for concern. All right. Uh, we can uh, see. Uh, yes. Desculpa. Uh, eu eu acredito que. Can you, o, can, can, you, can you switch to English, please? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, I believe that there will be no success in the fight against corruption if the political system does not change. There should be reforms in the political system. There should be reform in the justice system. You know, fighting financial corruption, fiscal corruption, this is a consequence of a corrupt political system. What we have in Angola is the cancer. The cancer in Angola is the political system, is the governance. You know, fiscal system is just a consequence. You know, fiscal, fiscal corruption, fiscal corruption. Hello, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, fiscal, yeah, financial corruption is just a consequence of the corrupt political system in the country. So as long as there are no in, in a normal democracy, uh, Alternate, alternating power, you know, alternative power in the country. If the political system is not changed, if the electoral, yeah. the national elect, election commission, which is controlled by one single party, which is the ruling party, which, mm -hmm. if that is not changed, if the justice system is not changed, whereby most of the people are members of the ruling party. You know, the fight against corruption, it is just, you know, it's it just a smearing, it's just, you know, a trick. 
is okay. not Syria. Okay, thank you, Elias, because uh, we're going to uh, try and get back to Luanda. We can see uh, Abel Shibukuvuku again, and it's a good thing because we have a couple of questions for you, Mr. Shibukuvuku, from our viewers. One is from Guilherme Antonio, and he says, Força, Abel, já devia estar a organizar uma mega manifestação para o povo testemunhar o teu eleitorado. And that is a, a, a question in Portuguese, in English it says, Go ahead, Abel, you should be organizing a huge demonstration so that people can witness who is your electorate. Um, that's one question for you, uh, Abel Shivukuvuku. The other one is from Zeka M. Senda. Mr. Shivukuvuku, why don't you negotiate with PRS? It's an established party. It has a good electoral base, but lack of leadership. So Summarizing these two questions, Mr. Shivukuvuku, are you going to organize a demonstration or are you going to negotiate with other small parties in Angola? Uh, most of the people, responsible people, are with the strong indignation of what the Yempel has been doing concerning the pressure. We understand also. And work within the basic rules because of the pandemic of COVID-19. But we decided that we will have to consider if we have, we have to make a big run. Next Monday, we will send new documentation to the Constitutional Court, although we have no expectation of change of behavior. And this will determine if we go to the streets or if we, so, we follow the path of participation in the system. That's number one. Number two, they need to understand, I've been telling that uh, what we are trying to do is to participate in the political life. If they close one door, we will be forced to follow other doors that exist. People are trying to say, okay, fine, Shivukuku, if they don't allow you, take us our party, we give you our party, we give you our structure. What we, <coughs> what we want to do is, whatever happens in 2022, we will participate in the process of elections in Angola. Will you negotiate with other parties? That was the question from another viewer. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Another, another viewer was asking if you're going to negotiate with other parties, with PRS, with PRS. Our main agenda is to fight for the legalization of pressure. That's basic. And we will continue struggle with the courts and we will continue mobilizing the public opinion in this country across all provinces. That's number one. Number two, we have decided also that whatever happens, we will have to be part of the political system in 19, in 2022. Regardless, the only thing is whatever institution that we choose, we will have to have common values, common principles, and common objectives. This is the basic, and in any case, we will have to find something. So uh, you're saying you're open to a coalition with other parties? We are open to a coalition with other parties. Also with UNITA? I'm hearing, I said that yes, we are first struggling for peer pressure, but we are open, provided there is common understanding about the principles, values and objectives so as to contribute positively to the evolution of our country. While we are on that subject of other political parties, uh, the Secretary General of UNITA said he would welcome your return to UNITA if you'd explain why you left and why you would like to come back. Are you open to returning to UNITA? I heard the declaration of UNITA people by the media. The question is, it's not a Belshibukuvuku. It's an institution. Praja is already an institution, well established across the country. And whatever would have to be done. Let's see if we can get the signal back from Luanda. Uh, I have a, a question. Yes, in the meantime, yes. We have more questions here, one of them for you, but go ahead, Malik. Friends of Angola, who puts on programs like this all the time, do they usually have these kinds of issues with connections in the IT? Well, 
I, I don't know Malik, but in the meantime, we, the signal is back from Luanda. Abel Shivukuvuku, we lost the audio there for you, and you were explaining whether or not you would be, you would accept returning to UNITA, and we missed most of your uh, answer. Would you, would you like to um, repeat your answer, even if in, a, in summarized form, please? Are you still there? Oh. Abel Shivukuvuku, can you hear me? I'm hearing, you are I'm hearing sorry. me. This has been challenging because we keep losing the, the, the sound from Luanda. We keep uh, you know, getting your, your voice kicked out of, the, uh, of our connection. And so I was saying, you were trying to answer the question as to whether or not you'd be willing to return to UNITA. And we lost most of your answer. Would you care to please repeat it? There is no issue of Abel returning to UNITA because we are a structure. We are an entity. Praja is already a structure with institutions at the top level, at the middle level in the province, and at the local levels. It's not a question of Abel Shivukuvuku. It's a question of an organization, Praja, number one. Number two, whatever happens, it has to be based on values, principles, and a common agenda. And to avoid what has been usually the behavior in Angola, in which individuals get into politics in order to solve their material problems, to gain some money. Our, our view is that this has not to be the, the, the object. The object has to be to contribute to the positive evolutions of our democracy, Well, we lost the signal again from Luanda. Um, yeah. You know, you got to play with the hand that you're dealt, right? So we are going to go to some other questions from our uh, viewers. Namely, there's a question here uh, for Malik Shaka. Do you think that corruption will work in Angola since all of those that need to be fought are the ones ruling the country? And I've asked that also to Elias, but I'll start with you. It's a very important question that because of the political monopoly that the MPLA has had for so many years, individuals who are associated with corruption, including members of the former president's family, are all members of the MPLA. Because the MPLA has hegemony, nobody is talking about Mr. Ngonda with FLNA reaping lots of money from corruption because he has no power. The same thing would be true of other political parties in, in the country. So the fight against corruption has to, in fact, primarily deal with the ruling party and secondarily, it has to be based on transparency and a strategy. My question is, has the government in Angola, the MPLA government, enunciated a clear strategy to fight corruption in the country? How do they propose to do it? And the citizens need to give them a report card that says they're either doing it very well or they're doing it very poorly. Very good, thank you. Well, we also have here a question from uh, Mulumes Mutumwen uh, concerning people who are convicted for small acts of corruption, but then people who do you know, big things, they are not convicted. So we, we already kind of answered this question. Um, so other than that question that you will answer, that was from Virinella da Silva. We have now a comment here from an official comment from Friends of Angola, uh, from Florindo. Uh, when we were, uh, Malik was raising the question of whether or not it's normal for Friends of Angola to have these kind of problems with the connections as we are having with the Bel Shivukuvuku now. So the official statement from Friends of Angola is, and I quote, we have organized several events in Angola and this technical connection issue with Mr. Shivukuvuku that we are experiencing is the worst we have ever experienced since we started organizing events online. So, well, it's either very bad luck or something else is amiss in here. But in any event, I think we, you know, 
just talk about the devil. We lost our connection with the devil again. So, Elias, um, how do you answer that question of what can the smaller political parties do, given that they have so little power? Would it make sense for Praja and PRS and FNLA and Bloc Democratic and UNITA to all form a coalition and try and get further in their uh, opposition against uh, the MPLA? Absolutely, you know uh, that, that 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 should be the that should be the strategy for uh, in the short, medium, and long term. You know, the the MPLA has been power for forty five years. It has created a system, you know, a system that uh, that you know retain maintaining power, you know, at all costs. Uh, is you know is their survival they know that you know they know that they have to do everything to maintain power uh, at all costs there is uh, as i said at the beginning you know as long anything that happens in angola if it's not in the political interest of the ruling party does not happen does not take place <laughs> it's about time it's about time that political parties learn, you know, to organize themselves from grassroots, you know, bottom, bottom up, you know. You know, there should be a mobilization of citizens of this country to demand more and more on issues of political reforms, on issues of justice reforms, election reforms, on issue of uh, fiscal transparency, that's the only way, you know, that's the only way uh, this country is going to change. What we, are, what, what we are observing, you know, even with the multi-party nation assembly, nothing functions because the ruling party has got the majority and every law, every law, every bill that goes into parliament if it's not according to their interest, it does not go through. So the question, you know, the question is what is the hope? The only hope for this country is the people. The people have to mobilize themselves, the, the political parties, the leaders of the political parties, civil society, they have to come down, you know, they have to identify themselves with the suffering masses of this country mobilize them for change. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen because for 45 years, nothing happened except, except the enrichment of a few people. Uh, following up on that, uh, I, I'll go back to Abel Shivukuvuku, which we, are, we have now back uh, online. Um, how much uh, power do you think a smaller opposition's party can exert. I mean, you have the experience, you know, you were a member of parliament, you were um, a uh, major leader of UNITA, you formed Casa CE, uh, which didn't get very far elections wise, and now you're trying to form uh, Praja, Servir Angola. Uh, how do you assess the power of smaller parties um, in a coalition or not, in, in working with the civil society to, to exact real change in Angola? The fundamental issue is that most of state institutions are just rubber print, print, printers of the system. Meaning that the parliament does not exercise the powers of a normal <coughs> parliament. They cannot control and fiscalize the government. They have to accept most of the documents that the, 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 the executive brings there. It's, it's meaningless. It exists but it has no powers really to give a relevant direction to this country. The institutions, parliament, courts, and all the other institutions are just rubber printers of the MPLA. Number hmm. oh. There we go again. We, we lost the connection to Avel Shivukuvuku. That's so just- We have to persist. Go ahead, go ahead. 
just has to force. We cannot resist what, because what the ruling party is trying to, to see is, is if we just stop fighting. We have to continue fight and force the changes that we have, we have to have. I do understand that uh, the population and the electorate is maturing across the country. Although the press is being controlled strongly now, most of the small parties don't have a purpose of have to, to really have an important imprint on the evolution of the country. Most of them make politics for material reasons not because of purpose of serving the country. This is what also we need to change so as to make political organizations authentic, credible, and acceptable with the purpose of contributing to the evolution positive of this country. You mentioned there the lack of independence of the private media. Um, how could things change? Does, um, does anyone in Angola have the financial wherewithal to say start a real independent newspaper or radio station or TV station? Because even uh, Radio Ecclesia, the, the Catholic station, has had to suffer accusations that they are in cahoots with the government, that they get financial help, that they cut down on their political um, their reporting, and they have had these accusations for many years now. So does anyone have the political will and financial wherewithal, wherewithal in Angola to start something really independent? The question is not only resources. There are individuals who could have resources, but the question is the rules that allow for the legalization of political parties, of newspapers, of television, of radio, the rules. That because the Minister of Communication of the government, the ruling government, has to authorize. If they don't authorize, that's the problem that Radio Klaas had all along the years. And whoever tries to legalize something, even if he has the resources, if he doesn't align with the desire, with the will of the political ruling party, he may not succeed. This is the problem. The question here is the fundamentals. What is the purpose we have in building our country? Is just power or to allow our citizens to be free and to have social justice? This is the basic problem that we have in this country. Uh, Elias, uh, the Washington Post as one of the greatest mottos I have seen recently for any news organization. Its motto is democracy dies in the dark. Um, is there ever going to be light in Angolan democracy if a real independent media is not allowed? Well, uh, I think that quote applies very well for the US uh, because in Angola, democracy has never had a chance to be born, you know? Uh, I think they tried to conceive it, but it never, it never got out, it was never born. So. Uh, the, the issue in Angola is not there are people who, who, uh, who can do it. The, the problem in Angola is just the neurotic, I call it just a neurotic control of the ruling party. You know, the ruling party believes in control. They can't let it go. Okay? Are there people willing to open, you know, community radios? Yes, there are a lot of people. There are people uh, who are there to open, you know, some commercial radios. Yes, there are people. You know, from what I know, there, there, are, there are, you know, dozens and dozens of requests of projects for people who want to open radios. The ruling part doesn't, you know, I, I don't want to call it the government because for me, the government is an extension of the ruling part. It's just the same. The ruling part does not want alternative voices, different voices in this country. For them, democracy is just one voice where, which everybody listens and follows. So there is no space. In Angola, there is no space. You call it, talk about the private sector that you know, Mr. Bell 
has been speaking. Who are the private sector in this country? And why is the economy going, going so bad? You know, it's because the private sector is connected with the, with the, with, with the ruling part, with the government. They are not serious, you know, they are not genuine private sector in Angola. You know, people are talking about TV Zimbu to be a private radio. Now we saw what has happened. People talk about TV Palanca, you know, to be a private uh, television. We saw what happened. The issue is control. Is this neurotic control of the ruling party? If they can just let it go, because democracy is to let go some of the power that you think you have, which in reality you don't have. And you know, when you want to have what you don't have, then use every means possible to ensure that that power, which you don't have, stays with you. Okay, well, that leads us into the next question by one of our viewers, Malcolm Sholani, is asking that given the corrupt institutions that exist in Angola, do you believe that that, there, that can be alternation in power in Angola? And I would start with you, Malik. Can we really have a powers switching, I mean, parties switching power in Angola, or, you know, that's just something of a long-term dream? I think it is not a short-term project, but I'm of the opinion that there will be change in Angola because the government will find itself in a position of having to bring about change as dissatisfaction increases. If you look, Angola is a middle income country, but when you look at the amount of poor people in the country, where people don't have access to clean water, don't have access to food, don't have access to employment. And despite the fact that it's a middle income country, the number of children who don't find places in, in school. So with pressure from the people of Angola, I think that there will have to be change and that Angolans can't give up. They have to keep fighting the good fight. And in my opinion, they will prevail. Abel Shivukuvuku, what's your take on that? How hopeful are you that Angola can really be like, quote unquote, a normal democracy anytime soon? Well, just as he was getting ready to, there you go, there you go, go ahead. Democracy in Angola will not be a one-step project. Democracy will have to be a result of a permanent, consistent endeavor. And I do believe strongly that society is mature. As we see, our population is maturing. And even we... difficulties, we have to be consistent. We have to be perseverant. And then in time, we will achieve every step of the process. It's been really a challenging day, maintaining this three-way conversation. Um, but go ahead, Abel. Uh, we can hear you again, I think. I don't know if you understood what I said. I said in Angola, democracy will never be a one-step project. In any case, the government and the ruling party have no conditions to continue going backward. At this moment, we have an authoritarian democracy. As far as the laws are concerned, they seem beautiful, but the behavior and the practice is very negative. What is necessary is that everyone who believes Everyone who has convictions has to persevere, has to continue. And in time, the population will mature, the institutions will change, and all of us, we, have, we will have to be instruments of this process. It has to be 
a long-term struggle, but it will succeed. I do believe. How do democracies, I'll go back to you, Elias, uh, how do democracies thrive when the rules are set up against them? You know, it used to be that uh, the way ruling parties would control power through elections, and we've had elections in many, many countries for many decades that are totally corrupt and fraudulent, would be by stuffing the ballot boxes. On election day, the lights are off, you start writing blank ballots for your candidates, and you fill the boxes with those, uh, those ballots. Now that's not how it happens. It starts many, many years before by the way the, the legal framework is established. So corruption starts with the rules that decide and allow who's going to be a candidate, who's not going to be a candidate, who can vote, who cannot vote. Well, we're, have, we're having this problem right here in the United States. By the way, many states, because in the United States, each state individually administers its own election. We are witnessing efforts at, in many states to find ways to curtail the universal right to vote. So how do you fight that when people set up the rules and say, this is perfectly legal. Look, this is what the rules say. We can do these. So basically, there's a political side and a legal side, but the political controls the legal and then uses the legal to justify what it's doing. It's like a vicious cycle. Is there a way to break it, Elias? Absolutely. You know, let me just say, you know, it's, very, it's very sad you know, that what we are observing going on in the United States, because uh, we believe that the United States, you know, as a great democracy, could give us a good example. But the re recent events you know, in the US you know, just makes all of us sad, because uh, what is happening right now in the United States is really creating a precedent, you know, it's creating recipe, it's really allowing all, you know, giving green light, green light to main governments, in non, not only in Africa, but all over the world, you know, and particularly in Angola, that, you know, democracy is for me, it has to work for me and not for you. This is what is happening. And what is happening, you know, in the context of Angola? Uh, first of all, is the culture of democracy, the belief. As I said in the beginning, you know, there has never been a belief in democracy in the system. You know, the ruling part does not believe in democracy. Because democracy is, you know, alter, alternating power, is, is institutional reforms, you know, is participation. It's inclusion, it's transparency, it's good governance. You know, it's allowing people to express themselves, to organize, organize themselves. It's not the government to tell us what to do. You know, for 45 years, you know, Angola has been living in a situation where it's the government who decides our lives, who decides the lives of the people. This is not democracy, this is a, a dictatorship, you know. And this is what the country Angola has been living on. Let me just say one thing, you know. Uh, right now, in a lot of countries, and including Angola, for the last, you know, uh, let me, since, uh, for the last 28 years, since 1992, or so, uh, you know, democracy has been always in a danger, you know. We never had time, you know, for us to implement a democratic process in this country. For, for a simple reason, you know, international actors, you know, like the United States, you know, you, the US has been divorcing itself more and more in supporting the democracy, you know, political path development, human rights, uh, and so on. You, we see the European Union also divorcing itself, you know, for on the issues of democracy and governance focusing more on e economic cooperation. That's what we see, you know, right now, US mm -hmm. Angola is more economic oil and so on. But the issue of democracy, the issue of uh, human rights is out of the agenda completely, you know. And as I said, you know, there will be no success in the fight against corruption if there is no political and judicial, you know, reforms 
in this country. So corruption is going to be there because the political system will sustain it. Ilias, thank you. I will go back to Luanda in just a minute because I have two questions here from our viewers to Avel Shivukuvuku. But uh, if I can quickly go first to you, Malik, and ask you, just in light of what Ilias was saying, is the United States now a bad example for Angola and other countries with struggling democracies? There are troubling aspects of what's going on in the United States. The governor of Kentucky the other day said that he wanted to remove the right to vote of people who were taking part in demonstrations. Uh, this is problematic. And I would hope that countries around the world would see this as a negative example and not try to, to replicate it. The, but I think in the long run, the American people are going to bring back a resurgence of democracy in, in, in the country. There's debate, there's discussion, and on November the 3rd, people will go to the polls. You recently saw people in the streets in America because of uh, killing of unarmed Blacks, African Americans. And to me, this was a democratic struggle, an important democratic struggle. People were saying that we have to do something so that people are not being shot down because of the color of their skin. That's the real America to me. That's the essence of American democracy, where people will push for positive change. They'll push for a situation where people have adequate food, clothing, and shelter, uh, et cetera. We have a situation in the US, for example, with healthcare. It's the only industrialized nation in the world where people don't have guaranteed right to healthcare. So America, needs to change in a positive direction. And people in Angola need to move in a positive direction. And we need to look at those places where democracy is flourishing and use that as an example. Very good. Uh, I think that Avel Shivukuvuku is now able to join us again. Are you? Yes, I'm in line. OK, there you are. So I have two questions here for you, one from no, Manasseh, and another one from Ivarist Manuel. Um, Ivarist Manuel is asking, Mr. Avel Shivukuvuku, is it real that you are still in the game as far as the 2022 elections are concerned? If yes, can you please elaborate? Obviously, our agenda is to serve our country. I understand that political parties are not the objective to make a decision to make a, a strong impact on our societies. The objective is just not to have a political party, it's to serve the country. That's why with Praja or without Praja, we will serve we will try to participate in the political landscape and in 2022 useful to be useful because we do, because believe, we do believe that the quality, that the quality of, the, of democracy, the quality of political processes, political, economic, social processes is totally dependent on the quality of participation of its citizens. Is why I do believe that even with the difficulties, we have to be present with perseverance the question is values, principles, and objectives, and to believe that we are the ones who have to make it. We cannot just sit and expect that the ruling party will change. They will never change. Uh, Simon Manasse, that was a question from Ivarist Manuel. Uh, Simon Manasse is asking, Mr. Ravel, don't you think because of the coming election, the ruling party is trying hard to control the media, confiscating all of this stuff from TV Zindu and TV Palanca? The ruling party has a clear understanding that at this moment they are very, very weak, especially because the population is maturing, 
now there is a youth segment of the population which has gone to university and have other expectations and even controlling the normal and classic media now young people are in social media they understand that they follow things that's why i believe that they understand it they know that they are very weak another element that is in the equation is because of the division at this moment because of this supposed struggle against democracy against corruption which is not against corruption it's against impunity of the past which was systematic if if the ruling party wanted to make a serious struggle fight against impunity, no one will be immune. All of them will have to be in jail. Then they cannot do it. That's why they are doing selected targeting. Which are the conditions for the selection? Only they know. The, wimp, the ruling party at this moment is seriously weak. That's why they don't want local elections because they would lose hegemony of the local power. That's why they are creating negative conditions for the election of 2022. The question is the actors. We, the actors, we have to be active, perseverant, and fight for conviction, fight for the democracy. Democracy is not a one-step point. It has to be a process. At this moment, the elements characterizing a democracy, we don't have them in Angola. Liberty. There is no democracy without liberty. And in this country, as much as you go to the interior, there is no freedom. Second, the rule of law. Here we don't have rule of law. Every small chief, every small official in the interior makes the law according to his wishes at the moment. Democracy has to be real, independent institutions, especially in the courts. We don't have them. Democracy has to be periodic, Free and fair elections, we don't have them. Democracy has to be the, uh, the administration, administration, independent and neutral administration. We don't have it. Democracy has to be the institutions of law and order, defense law and order. We don't have it. We have to fight for it. Well, thank you. And uh, we have about five minutes left. I would go back to Malik and ask you, uh, you have been following Angola on and off, mostly on, since 1973. Are you hopeful that things will change enough that you can be optimistic about its f future, politically speaking? I'm extremely optimistic because the human spirit cannot be killed. That people in Angola, they want to live a better life. They want to live a life without coercion. They want to live a life where their children can go to school, where there's food on the table, and people are involved in the process. So I'm extremely, extremely optimistic. I see all the barriers in the way, but I think that the people of Angola will overcome these barriers by coming together and by participating. Okay, well, Elias, uh Taking my clue from um, my cue from uh, from Malik, there's this saying that says, uh, "Rocks along the way, I collect them all to build a house." Uh, do you think that can be said about Angola? Pega nas pedras do caminho e vou construir uma casa. Are you optimistic? Uh, also like Malik. You know, I think uh, hope, uh, hope is something that we cannot, uh, we cannot afford to lose. You know, we cannot afford to lose hope. Uh, we cannot despair and we cannot give up. Uh, you know, the country belongs to all of us, uh, and this has a lot of place. You know, it has taken years of democracy uh, to start the country. You know, the issue of impunity and corruption has been answered many years now, out, and other issues come out, you know. And uh, we should believe as a Poland that there is nothing that stays forever. You know, there is nothing that stays forever. One day, things are going to happen. Even the ruling party believe that, that they have not come to stay in Angola forever because they are not the only Angolans uh, who can rule this country. 
Well, thank you. Uh, Abel Shivukuvuku, you will have the last word. What's your one minute speech on hope for Angola? I actually didn't I do believe that the mercy, goodness, social state will have the result of our long term struggle with strong commitment for the population. I believe that, and I have faith in the maturing of our population, and the long term Well, uh, thank you. We're just about uh, to reach the uh, the you know the time we have allotted for these um, the virtual roundtable. We would like to thank Abel Shivukuvuku, who is the leader of Praja, um, a new political party in Angola who's trying to get legalized. Uh, I I thank um, Elias Isaac, uh, who is an ordained minister and a long term. A political, humanitarian, and human rights activist. And I also thank Malik Shaka, who is a former congressional staffer and director of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, for participating in this roundtable to talk about democracy in Angola, uh, the state of democracy in Angola, the future of democracy in Angola. Um, I I'm your guest host, Luis Costa Rivas. I was invited by Friends of Angola to be your moderator, and I certainly thank Friends of Angola for their invitation. And um, I say goodbye to you all, and I look forward to seeing you on the next virtual roundtable organized by Friends of Angola. Have a good day. Thank you very much.